There's lots of exceptions. You can't have nature without things like that. But this is the absolute rule of thumb for how foraging and growth and predation operate across everything from fish to star as fish as predators, starfish, praying mantis, all the way up to things like big cats via stuff like crocodiles. It it's how it works. So it'd be very weird if it didn't also operate for dinosaurs. And then as I say, we've actually got the direct evidence for this from bite marks and stomach contents. They're taking small stuff. Bite marks give a lot of information. Yeah. That's a powerful signal in paleontology. Yeah, absolutely. I've done really quite a lot of work on it and they can tell you an awful lot if you've got the right understanding of the burial conditions, because you the weird thing that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is you basically can't take fossils at face value, particularly when you're trying to get into stuff like behavior and ecology, because so, between the animal dying and the paleontologist digging it up, potentially quite a lot has happened. And that's where it's really easy to start misinterpreting things because if you just go I, I had one like this not too long ago where i was an editor on a paper and the, the authors had done a pretty good job to be fair but it was this discussion of whether or not several animals were together at the time of their death mm -hmm. said multiple um theropods together in this quarry and it's like right but there was loads of debris and you had loads of things like fish scales and other small bones and it's like okay but this looks like these animals die potentially died somewhere else and then a flood or a river washed them into this bay or a channel or it then the water level dropped and they ended up together but that doesn't necessarily mean they were together when they died and so just because you've got three animals together what is potentially the story of how they got there so you have to consider multiple explanations and then try to figure out what is the most likely yeah or yeah. what can you test with various bits of evidence. So there was some uh, tyrannosaur inflicted bite marks on a duckbill from Mongolia that I worked on years ago. The specimen was from Mongolia, but it was held in Japan in a Japanese museum. I was working with the Japanese on it. And I'm I'm not a taphonomist, so the study of like decay and the history of specimens, and I am in no way, shape or form a geologist. I did zoology for my degree. Um, but the guys I was working with, like they were really hot on erosion and damage. And they were looking at some of the way the bones had been damaged. And they're like, okay, we're pretty confident that the bite marks are sitting on top of erosion. What does that mean? So it means that the animal had died uh, and it was found in a it was found in sand covered, but in what would have been a river channel. So this animal has died, washed downstream, ended up on a sandbank. The sand is whipping past because I've been in a sandstorm in, in China and it is not fun. And that's starting to etch some of the bones and damage them. And after that, there's a bite mark? After that, you're getting bite marks coming in. So oh, that can man. only be scavenging. That thing has been dead and sitting out for days, possibly weeks, before something came along and chewed on it. Wow. It pretty much can't have happened any other way. And you have to take these really subtle signals to, yeah. to reconstruct the story. But then you can start piecing some other stuff together. So in this case, the skeleton is pristine. It's one of the best hadrosaur skeletons out there. It's certainly the best from Mongolia I've ever seen. Um, and all the bite marks are on one bone, the humerus, the upper arm bone. Every, every mark. The, we, we went over the rest of the skeleton, nothing. And then the humerus is chewed to bits. There's bites all over it. But when you look, there's two really distinctive patterns. There's deep circular punctures and remember what the shape of this thing looks like <laughs> yeah at the ends and then along the delta pectoral crest okay it's much much bigger in a hadrosaur but this bit but remember that's where all the big muscles attach there's all of these types of this is from a different bone but different animal but all these types of close parallel scratches mm -hmm. and wow. so that looks like selective feeding because it's using its giant crunchy teeth at the ends to get the bone off and this is off a buried skeleton and then it's got these actually t-rex has really small teeth at the front of its mouth right right in the front where our incisors are they're called incisiform teeth they look like incisors they're a fraction of the size of the big ones um and they've got a really weird flat back mm -hmm. and that's what these are it's hidden this with the front of the mouth and pulling and that's mostly for eating yeah and that's why it's just on the delta pectoral crest, because that's where all the muscles are. Mm. So it's, I always liken it to getting something like an Oreo, and you take the top off, 
and you scrape the cream out with yeah. your teeth. <laughs> it, I think most people have done that. Yeah. Right. But but that's what it's doing. So it's got this little row of teeth, yeah. and everywhere you get lots of muscle, you get little rows of teeth together. So pulling. there's different bite marks for sort of fighting, killing, and then there's different bite marks for eating. Yeah. So it kills and dismembers with the big teeth up the side, yep. and then it feeds with the little front teeth. And all of that has evidence. Yeah. In the bones. Yep. 